in chapter 24. So let's open with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll give you a quick opportunity for any questions, um, especially about Genesis 22, uh, and we'll move on from there. Father, we thank you for the night and uh, the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for these that are here. And uh, Lord, we pray that you bless our study of your word. Give us your wisdom as we, as we go through what you have written in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Genesis 22 was Abraham offering Isaac, and we spent three weeks on that. Did anybody else have any questions on that? We, like I said, we spent three weeks on that. It was longer than we typically will spend in a chapter. Um, but that is such a rich passage of Scripture. And a very important, it's a, it's a turning point, not only for Abraham, but um, uh, turning point for a lot of things in Scripture. But. Paul? <laughs> Don't know. Don't know. Um, Abraham might not, Abraham and Isaac may have not even been at home um, with mom, they, you know, they were, they had cattle and herds, you know, cattle and herds and all of that. Um, in fact, when we get into chapter 23 and Sarah dies, Abraham is not there with her when she dies. Um, so they might not even been together, um, and she may have only found out about it afterward. Then again, they could have been together. God talked to Abraham. Abraham said okay and didn't tell his wife what they were doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He showed, he sh again, in there, he's a picture of Christ and submitting to his Father's will. Um, it's, a, it's a big ask to, be, to die. But both Isaac and the Lord... Jesus, both were obedient unto death. So. All right, anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right, uh, let's just touch on Genesis 23. I led into it a little bit last week because we had a few minutes, um, and then we will um, jump into chapter 24. Narrative uh, begins to pick up some steam again in chapter 24, verse uh, 1 of chapter 23. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Again, Abraham was not there when she died. He would have had to been summoned and uh, would have taken some time for him to get there. So she would have been probably long dead when he finally arrived, um, and uh, you, you wouldn't want to do a viewing under those circumstances. Um, so she's 127 years old when she dies. Interestingly enough, she's the only woman in the Bible to have her age given at death, and uh, I think it's because she was a pretty special lady, and uh, so God recognized her in that way. And we have a good idea then that Isaac would be 37 years old. She's 127, then Abraham's 137, and uh, that makes Isaac about 37 um, at this point in time. So she dies, verse 3, And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner unto you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth, and he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zophar, uh, Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for the possession of a bearing place amongst you. 
And Ephron uh, dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron, the Hittite, answered Abram, Abraham, I, I told you, once we switched over to Abraham, I'd call him Abram. Uh, Abraham, in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me, the field I give thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee, and the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee, bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land, and he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money, with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the, uh, in all the borders round about, were made sure and Ab unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gates of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan, and the field and the cave uh, that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So we... <clears throat> Why do we have this lengthy discussion about the price and all of that? Uh, a couple things. This is, um, interestingly enough, this is the only land in the promised land that Abraham actually ever owned. <laughs> uh, he didn't own any of the other land. This is all that he actually owned, and he bought it. Um, two, this gives us a glimpse into some of the cultural practices of the time and just how they conducted business. They didn't write out formal contracts. They, they didn't do that. They do is get a bunch of, of uh, dignitaries from the town or the village or city, whatever it was. They would get them together, and the negotiation would be done right in front of those witnesses, and the agreement made, and the money uh, would change hands, and all of this would be done with witnesses rather than written contracts. Um, and... Uh, the scripture makes a point to say that Abraham went to the merchant and the merchant weighed out the money and verified this is 400 uh, shekels of silver. We, we do that on large transactions today. When, when anything's being done in a legal sense, we usually do that through a title agency and there's wiring instructions or you know, instructions to uh, change hands and that title agency verifies that the money has actually changed hands and that it, it has been collected and then received on the other end, and so thus then everything, the contract's now executed. Um, and so all of that, um, all of that are, are just things that are, are fairly common sense, um, and they were done in a very similar fashion to still what we do today when we, we, we have a legal transaction and we want to make sure that it is, it is well known and well documented. We do that in the form of contracts. We have notarizers to notarize the, um, uh, the documents. We have title agencies and uh, different, different officials like that that will certify and guarantee and represent both sides. And nothing different here. But notice at first they, they, they said to Abraham, hey, well, any one of us here will give you a burying place. That's, that's not a problem. You, we, we love you and you're a prince to us. And God has been with you and blessed you, and so we, any, you, just, you just pick out the one that you want, and we'll give it to you. And Abraham, in multiple times, the scripture records that he bowed himself to them. Not in submission, he was bowing in, in respect and reverence. And you see the, the carefulness back and forth, you know, hear me, you know, hearken unto me, um, you know, and you see that the... the, the a very stately conversation that they're having, a very high level. Um, it's not, hey, uh, what would you sell me that field for? Uh, 400 shekels of silver, done, next. Um, not that kind of thing. No, uh, hey, Abraham, you're a prince. You, you name the one. Any, any guy here in this room would give it to you. We, we know that. And I'm sure they all said, yeah, just tell us which one you want. We, we would be honored to have Abraham burying their dead in our sepulcher. What Abraham did not want to do 
was to mix his dead with their dead, and he didn't want to become beholden to them in any way. God had given him that land. God had made some promises to him. That was God's land that was going to be given to Abraham. Whether Abraham understood what the future would hold or not is unclear, and, and I would say he probably didn't understand a lot of that. Um, God gave him some insight into them going into Egypt and being slaves, but then being brought out of Egypt. But Abraham may have known that at some point in the future, my descendants are going to throw you out of this land. Um, he, didn't, he didn't want to make friendship with them. He, didn't want, he, he was going to conduct business with them because you have to, but he wasn't going to be yoked to them by allowing them to give him that. Does that make sense? If Abraham was only concerned about money, he would have gladly accepted the gift and, and gone on. Abraham wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about the appearance of our families forming an alliance and maybe our families intermarrying at some point and the promise being lost and compromised that God had made to him through Isaac, through Jacob, through, you know, down through the line, didn't want that to be compromised in any way. And so he said, no, I will, I will buy it. Uh, you, you, you name the price. So they said, well, which one do you want? And he named it, Ephron's um, plot down there. That's the one I want. Uh, and, and again, the offer of, you know, hey, I'll give it to you. No, I'll pay you what, what is due, and I'll give you what is fair. Ephron named a price. Abraham accepted it immediately, didn't negotiate, didn't argue with him, didn't say, 400, man, how about 365, you know? Uh, didn't do that. Just said, if 400 is what you want for that, Abraham was taking as high a road as he possibly could here. He could have had it for free, but that's not the point, okay? God can bless his people with free stuff, but if the free stuff comes with strings attached to it, then it's going to cost you far more than just weighing out the 400 shekels of silver. So you've got to make sure that what you're doing isn't yoking you to this world, and it's not yoking you to the lost, and it's not yoking you to things that you can't go along with, even if it's free. You're better off just paying for it. So Abraham goes to the merchant. He weighs out the 400 shekels of silver. The merchant certifies in front of the witnesses that that's 400 shekels of silver. The money is given to Ephron. And then the Bible says that they went and made the, the place sure. So the property that Abraham bought was made sure. What that means is they marked it well. They, they all left and they got their servants together, or however they did that. They went there and they built, they put pillars up and they, they put markers up and there were boundary markers, uh, not little pins in the ground that we find with metal detectors and GPS stuff like we do now. The way they mark properties, they put a big heap of stones at the corner and big heap of stones at the next corner and big heap of stones at the next corner. And they probably had some kind of engravings on there in the stone. This is Abraham's, you know, for the burial of his family and do not enter and do not disturb and stay out of here. And, and so this area was all well marked. It was well, well known. Whether they built a fence around it, I don't know. Uh, the idea made sure doesn't necessarily mean that they would have had to secure it and put an alarm on it and have German shepherds patrolling it. Um, just the idea that it was known, you couldn't go on to that property without knowing that you were trespassing on Abraham's cemetery, basically. Once that was done, once the transaction was completed and the property all marked out, and that really was the full consummation of the deal, then Abraham took Sarah to the cave and buried her and put her in that cave, made, made it sure, meaning he secured it, uh, secured it against any wild animals that would come and made it clear this is a grave site. This is, this is not a cave, it's not a gold mine, it's not a silver mine, it's a burial site. And that was made um, clear and it was made sure so that anybody who violated that would not be able to plead in ignorance at the end of the day. Well, I didn't know what this was. Mm, no, no, you wouldn't know what it was. And the children of Heth probably wouldn't have dealt very kindly with you because of how much they respected Abraham. So 
It's, this is something that um, will pop up, and I, I, the scripture doesn't, God doesn't ever waste his time talking about things that aren't important. This is here for a reason, not just historically, but uh, this will come up again in the book of Genesis. We will see this uh, on a couple more occasions, and so when we get to those things, we will talk about them in greater detail. Any questions about the burial place? Uh, Diane? Diane? Well, you, know, you think about it, Abraham had been nomadic um, really since they left Ur, the Chaldees. Um, so you're, you're talking 60-some years, maybe, about 60 years since they really left home and they've never gone back and they never intended to. Uh, and for that 60 years, they had just been nomadic and dwelling in tents, which was actually very common still in that time period. Uh, in fact, in the Middle East, there's, it's not all that uncommon to have nomadic tribes and people there now um, in 2023 A.D. So um, having, having his own place to bury anybody, one, he hadn't needed to bury anybody up to this point because... Yeah, you would think it, was, it would have been thought through, um, you know, but I think because of their nomadic lifestyle, it was just wherever they were at the time that one of them died, that would be the place where they would establish a burial site. Um, that seems to be the place Abraham gets shipped back to and Isaac gets shipped back to and a lot of the family end up getting shipped back to that, um, that spot. So my guess is... They were in the south, um, down near Hebron. They were down in that area, and you know they'd probably talked about it and just decided, well, you know, if we're down here and one of us croaks, then go go talk to them. Uh, if we if we go back up into the Jordan Valley and one of us croaks, then go t we're going to talk to these people. Um, that would be my guess is um, that because they were nomadic and didn't own any property and all of that, that they just Figured they would wait until the time came, which when the time came, that's when Abraham moved on it. So, yes, sir. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I, I, one of these days, maybe I'll make it over to Israel, and you know that'll be a stop on there. There'll be a big Catholic church sitting on top of it. Um, we build a Catholic church on top of everything. Um, so I, we know the general area, um, but you know, a cave near a city, and out in that region, a cave doesn't narrow it down. So there's a lot of caves out there. So we don't know, and you know, they've been they've been in the ground for three thousand plus years. So there's probably not much left anyway to find. So. So as far as I know, they don't have a they don't have a historical monument somewhere that says this is the burying place of Abraham and Sarah. So, and then three thousand years, the topography can change a lot. So um, where we once thought something might have been may not be may not be accurate. So all right. Yeah, and you know, and again, Moses is Moses is writing this. This is what it was called when Abraham bought it. This is what we call it today, which is Hebron today. Um, so, <clears throat> again, that's another difficulty sometimes in deciphering some biblical locations because the cities moved around a little bit sometimes. They didn't stay in the same place, or that city might have been destroyed, and a thousand years later, another city bearing the same name, was built in the neighborhood, and 
Um, but uh, the accuracy of the scripture is, is great. The cave of Machpelah, which is Hebron today, um, <clears throat> and it says it twice. Re repetition is God's volume control. So. Okay, let's go into chapter 24, take a little time in this, because now the narrative is going to shift away from Abraham and to Isaac. This is really where we start studying the life of Isaac uh, at verse 1, and Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now, this servant is, uh, is going to be charged by Abraham. Abraham is old and well-stricken in years, okay? Abraham says, I don't know how much time I have left. I want to make sure that my son is cared for, and though everything I have will be Isaac's, this particular servant had the charge over everything and had done really well for Abraham in managing all of Abraham's affairs. And so he puts Abraham in this place, or he puts um, this servant in this place, to do an errand for him to help him procure a wife for his son um, and to make sure that it is not a daughter of the Canaanites. Again, Abraham does not want to be tied to these people because he knows that these people are wicked and they don't worship God and, and that, that someday his descendants are going to possess this land, which means the descendants of Canaan are going to be dispossessed of that land. So he doesn't, he doesn't want to dilute the promise, and he doesn't want to, um, to compromise what God has told him. And so he won't, he won't, be, he won't accept the, the gift of the cave of, at Machpelah. He, he will buy it. He will make it legal. It will all be above board. Now he's saying to his servant, do not, do not, do not, do not. I'm going to make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Uh, and this idea of putting your hand under, under, uh, your, uh, under my thigh is uh, just a, it, it was one of the ways in which they swore. It's a, um, it's a personal, it's a personal type of a vow. And it's like Abraham saying, come real close to me. I wanna, I, I'm, I'm going to make you, you're going to promise me something. I want, I want you in real close where we can look eyeball to eyeball. Because I, this, is, this is important to me. So you're not going to do that. Verse 4, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? Now the servant says, Well, what if I can't get her to come? Do I need to get Isaac and bring him on this journey? And Abraham, verse 6, said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. No, my son's place is in this land that God has promised him. See, Abraham's learned this lesson before. When Abraham left the promised land and went to Egypt, he picked up some bad habits. And those cost him dearly. He said, I don't want my son leaving. He's going to stay right here. This is where God told us to be, and this is where we're going to stay. So that's not going to happen. Uh, verse 7, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. Abraham said, look, God's going to take care of this. Uh, he, we don't want a wife of the Canaanites. I want you to go up to Haran, where my family lives, where I've got, I've got cousins, you know, Isaac's got cousins and other family members and things of that nature. I want you to go up there. I want, I want Isaac to marry within the family. I don't want him to marry these pagan people. I want him to marry within our family. 
So, take, so go up there and find this wife. And God's going to send his angel ahead of you to find the right one. You don't have to worry about her not coming. But if she, if she won't come, she's not willing, if, if this exercise fails because she's not willing to come, then you're clear of the oath. You've done your job, and I won't ask anything more of you. But God's going to send his angel, and you're going to find the wife, and you're going to bring her back, and, uh, and all is going to end well in this. Again, this is not the Abraham of Genesis chapter 21 and before, is it? Here, now, Abraham is just so locked in and so sure of everything that God has promised him. He's like, eh, just go. God will send his angel. It'll work out. It'll be fine. Bring her back. See you in a few weeks. Have fun. You know, don't take any wood nickels. Um, and so the servants swear, and, and he's now got this vastly personal mission. This is not a business trip. This is a personal errand that he is running for his master. Verse 10, the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. So as you note in here, the servant didn't have to go to Abraham and say, I'd like to requisition 10 camels and this amount of supplies and this number. This guy, like Joseph at Potiphar's house, Abraham just said, I trust you, just do whatever. And so this guy just went, he got the equipment that he needed, and he, he got the camels, and he got the supplies, and he got the people he needed. Whatever, whatever he thought he needed, he just took, and he went. And he went into the city of Nahor, in verse 11, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, Send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here at the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she, say, she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So the servant goes and he gets to the well and he's expecting a line of women to start streaming out of the city because it was time for the women to come get their water in the evening. And so he had his camels kneeled down and he just decided to wait. While he's waiting, he says, God, <laughs> you, know, you, you and my master are pretty close, and I've seen you do some amazing things, and he speaks extraordinarily well of you, and uh, he's got complete faith in you. You've guided him, you've blessed him, you've directed him, and so now I'm asking for your help, not for me, but for my master. Uh, I, I want you, to, I want you to, to do this for, for my master, Abraham. Would you, would you send this woman out? When I ask her, to give me something to drink, she's going to say, I'm going to give you to drink, but I'm also going to give water for your camels. Let her be that one. Let her be that, that one that I'm looking for. Give me good speed. Don't, don't make me have to hunt around. I, don't make this a mystery I have to solve. Don't make this an uh, Indiana Jones movie, you know, or i got to go through all these hoops. Just let me go, and, and let's, let's settle this thing quick. You do this for my master's sake. And so uh, God honors him, um, and it says in verse uh, 15, And it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out. Now, if Rebekah is coming out of the city and he's not yet done praying, that means she started heading to the well before he started praying. You think God's waiting to find out what you need to meet your needs. She was already on the way to the well. Servant started praying. While he's praying, she's coming his way. And it says, uh, it came to pass before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born, of, uh, born to Bethuel, the son of Milpah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. 
And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drink. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all of his camels. Now, the, the servant doesn't yet know if this is the one or not. What he's asked God is, let the woman who says this be the one, not, you know, okay, you've got the one, she's, she draws water for the camels, it's settled, we're going. No, he, he's going to have to verify this a little bit. Verse 21, And the man wandering at her held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, moreover, unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house uh, these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the man unto the well. And it came to pass, when he saw the earring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. Uh, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his uh, camels and gave strong provender for the cam camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat. And he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, speak on. Well, you know, he said, and here's dinner. And he said, no, 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 we're not having dinner until I speak my piece. I got, I'm, I'm on an errand, I'm on a mission. I got, I got something more important than eating to do. Let's do that first. Let's do the master's business first, and then we'll do my business after that. That's a pretty good example, isn't it? Worry about the Lord's business first. Worry about us next. Um, and so, verse 34, and he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go into my father's house, into my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he repeats through the, the whole story here, repeats it. So we get a clear understanding of both sides of this. Abraham understood it, the servant understood it. Verse 42 says, And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and, all, uh, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. Before I had done speaking, in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank. And she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? And goes down through the whole story and it says, um, in skipping down just for the sake of time a little bit tonight, um, verse 50 says, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife. And the Lord, as the Lord has spoken. 
And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten, after that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Rebekah rose, and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well of uh, Lehi Roy, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening time, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel, for she had said unto her servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You do a little digging and uh, you pay attention to some things that uh, the scripture talks about in Isaac's life. Three years have passed since Sarah had died. Sarah died at, at when Isaac was 130, or when Isaac was 37. Uh, his dad was 137. Three years have passed. Uh, Isaac is 40 when he and Rebecca marry. Uh, they will wait 20 years before God gives them children. Jacob and uh, or Isaac will be uh, 60 years old at that point when uh, when Jacob and Esau are born. Um, it's uh, it's a far cry from a hundred, um, so you know. Abraham might have said, "Now, son, don't be in a hurry to have kids. You know, you, you've got another hundred years ahead. You, why don't you wait another 50, 55 years?" You know. Um, no, he probably didn't. He was probably looking forward to grandchildren. Uh, and, but God had held Rebecca childless for 20 years. We'll see that when we get into the next, um, next passages. But uh, isn't it amazing how all of this uh, just comes together and how God superintends this. Abraham wants to do the right thing. He wants to honor God. He wants to fulfill the promise. He doesn't want to get in the way anymore, and he doesn't want to compromise anymore, and he doesn't want to figure it out on his own anymore. He just wants God to take it and, and do what he needs to do, and he's given this whole thing over to God now, and now look how easy his life has become. Before his life was, oh, there's a drought. Let's go to Egypt and figure it out for ourselves. Uh, oh, uh, somebody's looking at Sarah the wrong way. She's just my sister. Um, he did that twice. Um, you know, he, well, I'm getting up there in years. If I'm going to have kids, uh, better start now. And uh, all right, well, I'll take Hagar. Uh, we'll raise up kids. Abraham spent a lot of his life trying to help God out and figure it all out and make it all work and plug it all together. Now Abraham's just like, well, God, you made a promise. You've got to figure it out. I'll just do whatever you tell me to do along the way. Just keep me out of the way, and I'll... I'll... And now Abraham's life's easy. He got the promised son. God says, take him, offer him a burnt offering. Abraham does. He gets to see God work in a, in a, in a special way. Talked about that over the last three weeks has a unique and close relationship with God. He's the friend of God. Uh, and, and now he just tells the servant, hey, uh, go up to my, my folks' place, uh, find a wife for Isaac. God's going to send his angel. It's all taken care of. Just, I just need you to go. I'm too old to make this trip. I need you to go. Bring her back. We'll have a wedding. My son will have a wife, and we'll go on from there. And look how easily it all comes together. Because Abraham's not trying to figure it out. 
His servant's not trying to figure it out, trying to help God out, trying to make it manipulate circumstances, not trying to, you know, use man's wisdom and man's logic to make it all happen. They're just praying and they're just relying on God and they're just trusting in what God's told them to come to pass. And chapter 24 starts, Isaac is single. Chapter 24 ends, Isaac is married. And it doesn't take all that long. Um, you also get to see that arranged marriages were the custom, still are the custom in a lot of cultures, not just in Muslim cultures, but even in some more Orthodox Jewish cultures and in um, a lot of Buddhist and Hindu cultures uh, still have arranged marriages. Um, and you say, oh, that's so foreign. But our system isn't worked so well. So if you want to look at results, they have a better system than we do as far as results go. Um, I still wouldn't want that kind of a system, but they do a lot better. Really, if the system is letting God arrange your marriage, then you're in the right system. So, and if God doesn't arrange a marriage for you, that's okay too, as long as you're letting God lead you. It's good. All right, questions? We're on time tonight. Look out. Paul? Well, you know, you, you just stay busy doing what you know you're supposed to be doing and let the, let the results speak for themselves. Let, let God be responsible for the results. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, I look at my own life when it comes to, all right, what, what Bible college should I go to? The, the question wasn't, which Bible college do I want to go to? The question was, Lord, which Bible college do you want me to go to? And then... The Lord opened the door, and I knew that's what the Lord wanted, and, you know, there was no looking back. Um, you know, it came to getting married and, and all of that. Again, that I didn't have to date half the girls in the freshman class when I got there to figure it out. I didn't need, I didn't need to do that to figure it out. I just needed to wait and let God figure it out, and he did, and when... My wife came, and that was the one I was supposed to be get married to. You know, I I knew it very quickly, and you know, and it all worked out actually relatively easy. Um, so, it's not to say everything that's the will of God is going to be easy. Some things are going to be hard, of course, and the enemy is going to oppose. But um, you can't. You can't stop God's will for your life. Satan can't stop God's will for your life. You can choose to follow God's will for your life, and if you do that, there's nothing that will stop God from fulfilling his plan in your life. And, and that's, to that extent, it's easy. I, I, don't, I don't have to fret about a lot of these big decisions. God's already, God's already got it worked out. I'm just asking God to show me his will when I get there, and... Gotta gotta be patient. What? Yeah, be still. You know, you can't you can't do the things that God is supposed to do. You you have to do the things that you're supposed to do. Let God do the things He's supposed to do. If you get the job title confused, that's when you make a mess of things. Um, and the hard part sometimes is keeping your hands off of it. So I remember. Uh, couple pastor friends of mine, uh, they like to golf together, and um, one was a retired state trooper, and, uh, and then had been pastoring for a long time, and uh, they were out on a golf course, and it had rained, and uh, this course that they usually met and played at, because it was halfway in between where they pastored, um, had a real steep hill going down as you, after you teed off, there was a real steep hill going down, and uh, the pastor telling me this was in one in the passenger seat and not the retired state trooper. And, you know, as they were going down that hill, the cart started to hydroplane on the, on the paved cart path. And, 
you know, and the you know, retired state trooper, now pastor, is, is working on it. And he said, it took everything in my being not to grab a hold of the... If I had grabbed a hold of the wheel, we would have flipped. And I realized, this guy is a re state trooper. If he can't keep a golf cart from rolling over, what am I going to do from over here? Okay, this is the guy with the experience and the training, and he's in the driver's seat, and he's got a hold of the wheel. He doesn't need my help. And, of course, he straightened it out, and they, you know, they made it down the hill safely. But I remember, I remember this pastor telling me that story, and it's just, you know, it's just a great reminder that you know, God knows what he's doing. And when it feels like it's out of control, he doesn't need you to grab the wheel and help. He knows what to do. So just let him do his job. Let him, let him hold the wheel, and you sit there and pray, you know, uh, and know that if he can't get you through safely, nobody can get you through safely. So if he can't do it, what are you going to contribute that's going to make the difference? Uh, and so we have those times in our life when we just need to put our hands in our lap and let the master drive because he knows what he's doing. And uh, that, that story has stuck with me. And knowing these two guys, I laugh thinking about the looks on their faces going down that hill. Uh, love them both. They're both in heaven now, but they're probably still laughing about that story in heaven. Allie, were you raising your hand? Most often, because the ground over there is so hard, it is so much, so rocky. Um, burial above ground is still actually fairly common because it's, it's just digging through rocks. It's hard. So. All right. Anyone else? Okay. I got us done on time. You stopped asking questions on time. Look at this. We are, we're dangerous together. Give you a few announcements, and then we'll jump over to our prayer list. No, oh, you got to be kidding me! I just have my prayer list right in front of me. Maybe I'm just senile. It's always possible too. Okay, all right. Well, I don't have mine, so I'll write it down. Um, So those coming to the wedding, 2 o'clock is start time. Be here about 145, 150. That would be great. Um, so we don't have a line of people waiting to be seated. Um, this side's going to look like this side after tonight. Um, and just about every one of the chairs are going to be full. So, um, so be here. Know that you're not going to be able to just walk in and there's going to be 30 seats empty to pick from. Uh, it's, we're going to be telling you don't breathe. We're going to... Have you all pretend you're on an airplane? So we can cram as many people in here as we can. We'll, we'll have a few extra seats, but uh, it'll be a pretty full, uh, pretty full room. So we're uh, looking forward to that and getting everything set up. Um, so that'll be Saturday uh, here at the church, 2 o'clock. Uh, we are going to live stream on our website and Facebook page like we do for the other services. We still have people in California people in Wisconsin, people uh, from both of our families that uh, can't be here and want to watch, so I'm going to make that available to them as well. Sunday's Father's Day, and uh, so if I'm still physically capable of being propped up in the pulpit after the wedding on Saturday, uh, I will uh, be preaching, and uh, we have a gift for each of the fathers. We've got a, a video you'll enjoy as well uh, for dads. Dads will enjoy it more than moms might, but I think everyone will enjoy it. Um, and then no evening service this Sunday night with the holiday. Uh, just want you to be able to enjoy your family and all of that. So, uh, And then, oh, Sunday school, I'm going to be starting uh, just a few weeks. I'm going to be teaching things every parent needs to teach their kids. And this weekend, I'm going to be working 
more towards the younger kids. Um, and either the 25th or the um, 2nd of July, I'm going to be doing one specific to parents of adolescents, what you need to teach your kids. Um, and these are just things that, uh, saved or lost, you need to teach these to your kids. Because if you don't, Satan's got a book full of lies and he's going to feed them to your kid. And uh, they're going to be messed up uh, because of it. So that'll start this weekend. Um, and then uh, we've got several cases of water ready to have labels put on them. Um, so Tracy, you, you, you were the one that figured out how to do it. And if you want to, if you want to take a case home and put some labels on, see Tracy. She'll tell you how she did it, maybe do one with you if you're a little nervous about it, show you what, what to do. We can show you a finished product. It's not, yeah, yeah. If, if you have a case of water at home, instead of bringing the case here and then taking it back, just we'll give you some labels. You can put those on and bring them back to us, and uh, we'll have those for Fourth Friday, and I'll be handing those out. All right. And then the 25th, we'll have the bilingual service in the morning with the Spanish congregation joining us. We're looking forward to that. And, um, and then in the evening, we're going to have an abbreviated service and then uh, our, the, the church reception, uh, just so that everybody's had a chance um, to uh, congratulate them with the limited seating over at the reception venue. So that's all coming up. I'll tell you, June 19th is looking really good right now. It's going to be my new favorite day of June. But, um, so we're looking forward to Saturday. And um, uh, Saturday would have been my mom's 64th birthday. Um, so, so that's uh, nice that we could do that on her birthday. So we didn't plan it that way. That's just, that was the date we picked. And I said, oh, that was my mom's birthday. All right, uh, prayer requests. Who has a prayer request or you have an update? I don't have my prayer list in front of me, but I'm going to make some notes. Jan? Keep praying for Pastor Douglas. Anyone else? <laughs> 